Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 81. We'll talk about the new CDC school guidelines released last week, understanding low versus no risk again, and uh, the next surge which is on, our, on its way. Well, I got up this morning, it was interesting to see these three articles in the front page of the newspaper. Uh, first, uh, you know, the fall of the towers in Florida and how that's made headlines. Um, and although it's a tragedy, there are twice as many people who die every single day from coronavirus uh, as it died in this tragedy. Yet here we are tracking this fall, talking about the engineering and the data behind it and all the things they're going to do to study to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, right next to it is an article about the state finally bringing its numbers back and the frustrations that all of us are having by the fact that we're not allowed to even see basic numbers about a pandemic that's killing twice as many people every single day and the death rate's going to go back up again. And of course, at the top, uh, you know, our new, new athletic director, and, it, and a lot of times I've been using football as an analogy for understanding the strategy to deal with the pandemic. Uh, and seeing all three of these in the newspaper at the same time was just kind of an odd, uh, odd moment this morning. Uh, and so football. So, you know, one of the things I keep trying to explain to people, everybody wants to know the story, for example, what exactly is Lincoln Public Schools or any school going to be doing in August when kids come back to school? And people want to know in fine detail with thresholds and everything. And it's like, we just don't know that yet. And expecting us to have everything figured out right now, uh, given what little information and support we have is not realistic. It's like asking Coach Frost, what play are you going to call in the first play of the third quarter? Well, he can't tell you that. It's going to depend on a lot of variables. Is he going to be first and 10, second and long, third and short? Is it going to be raining, windy? Is he playing a run-heavy team? Uh, what's the scouting report going to show him? Is his health quarter back going to be healthy? We have just as many variables to go through before we make any final decisions for any school in the country. And so this is a, I think that people need to start being a little more realistic about what can be pushed out right now, given us that we're limited in data so much. Uh, and going back, you know, I think I really appreciate uh, Dr. James Lawler being pretty frank and honest this right now, that to hide the data a couple weeks ago right now, it'd be like if you're trying to drive down a rivet at night in the rain, blindfolding yourself is probably not the best idea. Uh, and so the lack of data is one of our challenges. The public health experts are not allowed to even see the data, so it's hard for people like us sometimes even to make good decisions because the state is hiding the data at times, and it's not just the state, it's others as well. Uh, and it's like uh, one of my favorite quotes by Dr. Edwards Deming was, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And some of you may not know that uh, Dr. Edwards Deming is actually from, uh, grew up in Iowa, went to college in Wyoming and Colorado, so he's a pragmatic Midwesterner. Uh, but you got to have data to make good decisions, and it's really, really important that we are clear about what data there is out there. Uh, one of the topics we'll talk about today, even uh, Dr. Lella talked about at the very last uh, section of the article today, you know, we're going to have to try to make decisions on the safety of children, but we don't even have good hospitalization data to know what the risk is if we bring the kids to school without masks. And I'll just come out and say it right now, I'm predicting we'll be starting with masks. Uh, maybe I'll be wrong, uh, maybe the numbers aren't going to do what we're worried that they're going to do, but uh, I don't think we're going to be starting schools without masks. So, uh, key takeaways from the CDC uh, guidelines updated on Friday. Uh, number one, we know, and this confirms everything we've seen, is that students benefit from in-person learning. That's best. Uh, remote learning just doesn't work well, especially for kids. Maybe if you're a graduate school, it's okay, but kids do best in person. Number two, vaccination is, is the best way to get out of this thing. We need to get uh, uh, more people vaccinated to have a safe return to schools. And there it is, number three, masks should be worn indoors by all individuals who are not fully vaccinated. Kids under, uh, under 12 cannot get vaccinated, therefore they should all be wearing masks. Uh, I'll just come out and say it and let's rip the band-aid off and be honest about it. Uh, so to get there, let's talk about two common misperceptions that are funnel funneling all these problems. Uh, number one, kids are low risk, but they are not no risk. So what do we mean by that risk? So uh, sometimes it's helped to look at it through another lens. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, of those 42,000 Chromebooks are kids, one of them has a defect and it's going to explode. It happened in another school district in this, in this uh, analogy and it killed the, that child and all, the, and all the other kids in, the, in that classroom were hospitalized. Uh, but we don't know which lap, which Chromebook it is. Are we going to say, you know what, we don't know which Chromebook it is, tearing them all apart will be a pain in the butt, it's low risk. We just won't worry about it. We'll just see what happens. Would we make that decision? No, we would not make that decision. We would not risk the life of one child in hospitalization, hospitalizing a class of 22. We would tear apart every Chromebook and figure out what was going on. Well, I didn't pull those numbers out of thin air. Those are the numbers of risk if we were to let coronavirus run rampant based on our best understanding of the numbers right now. So. How would we figure that out? Well, before Nebraska shut down its access to its data, it was uh, listing cases per 
by age, it was listing hospitalization rates by age, it was listing deaths by age, so that we could actually come up with a projection of how risky or not risky this would be. And so this top number, this is what I pulled off a, a month or two ago before they shut down access today, what those numbers were. Now, this is the what I would call the case fatality rate, and that's different than the infection fatality rate. That was something that people were confused with uh, back at the start of the pandemic, as a lot of folks out there pontificated and didn't know the difference. This is an identified cases, but most experts think that we are only identifying one out of five cases. So to have the infection fatality rate, we'd have to multiply this identified case for a five, five and then do the math and figure this out. And you, what you see is the risk is really low. Yes, only 0.1% of kids 0 to 19 were ending in the hospital, and only 0.002% were dying. That's a really low risk, yeah, which is nice. However, it's not zero risk. And that's how I came up with that exploding Chromebook scenario. Now, we can project uh, how many, we, well, we know how many kids are enrolled, current were enrolled this last year at, uh, at LPS. We can pull out the vaccination rate by age. I have to make a guesstimate for sixth graders because only a portion of them will be old enough to get vaccinated at the time. And project, you know, we're, we could probably be looking at, say, 31,000 kids maybe who are going to come to LPS in August unvaccinated. Well, 31,000 times these risk levels, that's one death, 22 hospitalizations. So that's how I came up with that exploding Chromebook analogy. Uh, now, now that we know that number, is that a reasonable risk to take? That's a policy decision, but the numbers is not a, we, is not a policy decision. We need these numbers so we can make an informed decision. Now, unfortunately, that's not the only risk uh, of, of coronavirus. Uh, one of the problems is long COVID. Uh, we're getting better data, uh, but not good data. Uh, and so another frustration, I'll use this Carl Sandburg quote, you know, it's, it's, it has to do with lawyers. If the facts are against you, argue the law. If the law is against you, argue the facts. If the law and the facts are against you, pound the table and yell like hell. And that's what a lot of the, the conspiracy theorists are doing. They're just yelling like hell and pounding the table, but they're not bringing any facts. They're not bringing any numbers and they're not bringing expertise. Fine, if you disagree with me, bring your numbers and your expertise and then maybe I'll listen to you. But we need numbers and expertise like that. So in addition to those potential deaths and hospitalizations, we have long COVID. And so we're getting better data on long COVID, at least in adults, uh, but we don't have good data on kids yet. So if we let 30,000 kids get infected this uh, fall because it's low, quote, low risk, what will be the after effects when in terms of long COVID? And some of these uh, side effects are not trivial. Uh, fatigue, trouble breathing, brain fog, uh, lack of uh, uh, taste and smell. And uh, we're seeing higher rates of diabetes, for example. Do we wanna put a child of 12 years old with long-term risks like that when we don't know those risks? No, so uh, we need to know a little bit about, more about long COVID before we just let it run rip, uh, rip roaring through elementary schools this fall. Another problem is that it's not just those kids. Uh, this article I've cited a number of times shows that basically in any community, 35% of the community is directly connected to the school because e a they're either a teacher, work at the school, attend the school, or go home to a household from the school. If you add up all those people, about a third of the community is connected to a school. So if it runs rapid through the school, it won't just affect the school, it'll go home to all those households. Some of those households will have unvaccinated adults. Some of those households will have vaccinated adults that are immunocompromised that despite their best efforts to be vaccinated and, and immune won't be because of their immune conditions. Those other people would be collateral damage as well. So it's really important that we have a safe return to school. Uh, and, it is, and it is worse than influenza. So people keep drawing these parallels to influenza saying, well, at least it's not worse than influenza. Actually, it is a little worse than influenza. And influenza itself is kind of bad too, actually. Uh, influenza does kill a couple hundred kids every year as well. And here in this case, uh, basically this just came out in uh, CDC MMWR a month ago, uh, that, the, that the virus uh, hospitalization uh, for rate for uh, COVID is actually worse than that, that it is for influenza. And that was despite the fact that we were doing containment measures like school uh, closures, wearing masks, physical distance. We still had more hospitalizations from COVID than we did in a typical influenza year. Another thing people are forgetting is in a typical influenza year, even that can close down a school. So here, just the year before coronavirus, we had these ed headlines that people have forgotten about. Schools closing amid flu outbreaks because a bunch of flu outbreaks in Alabama, Idaho, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Texas were closing schools because they had so many sick teachers. So it's just not the not just the kids. There are some uh, potentially 10, 20, 30% of teachers who might not be vaccinated. If they get sick, maybe we won't have enough teachers to even have school if we run out of, out of subs, for example. So this also is an issue we have to con concern ourselves with. 
So uh, essentially, I think there will likely be masks in school. I think your local epidemiologist, again, did a great uh, update, uh, basically kind of running through a lot of this stuff. I don't think the CDC did us a lot of favors in how and when they released the report, and they didn't provide a lot of support and guidance. And I, don't th I think our biggest challenge is our schools are not getting the support they need from public health right now. Uh, and you know, she, she was pretty honest. She says, I feel for parents that need to advocate for schools and politicians do the right thing to keep their kids safe. This is a problem, and it's driving me crazy, too. Uh, you know, and the situation is starting to get worse. Had I thought there might have been a chance we could have started schools without masks, but that's back when our numbers were this and our hospitalizations had, had dropped so low. But as you can see, this is to this, this is yesterday's hospitalization report for, for Lincoln. Yellow is the total, blue is how many are from Lincoln. So there's a lot of people from surrounding communities start, starting to come through. So we're up to 32 hospitalizations as of this morning in Lincoln. 18 of them are in county residents, 14 from our surrounding areas. If this keeps coming up, going up, we're going to have a problem again, and it's on its way up. So the other misconception, natural immunity likely will not protect you against new variants. You need a vaccine. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, this map was all yellow. This is COVID Act now, and you'll see that most of the country is now orange with several states turning red. Rates are going up. It's better to look at the more granular county level view. And here it is. Uh, you can see the hot spots, uh, especially in Missouri and Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, not too far from us. And of course, Wyoming, also not too far from us. Uh, viruses don't re respect borders. So this is coming our way. Essentially, it's in places where people aren't vaccinated. So if you look at the holes of people not vaccinated, here's a big one. Here's a big blob of red. Here's another big one. Here's we're going to start another blob of red. Uh, and so this is what you're going to be seeing here in the, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, you know, yes, in Lincoln, the good news is Lincoln is more, more vaccinated than average for Nebraska, but we're still not that high yet. And so it's sort of a glass half full, glass half empty. It's half full. And, and then if you look at the dashboard, we've got at least nice bars full of people vaccinated, but you just have to look at the inverse. The inverse is the people not vaccinated. What you see is there's a lot of people not vaccinated. Uh, it spreads amongst the community and the, and the young population. So this is who spreads it. And there's a lot of those folks who still are not immune. Uh, and they're also going to infect these people because they live and work and, and play with these people over here. So all of these people are potentially susceptible. There's still way too much uh, uh, to wood to burn here for this pandemic. So uh, we're, I think we're basically starting our, quote, fifth surge. First surge was when it hit, you know, the Northeast originally. Then people in the South thought, you know, it was seasonal, they'd be okay. So you had, had it rage through the South last summer. We had our humongous sur surge kind of October through January. A little blip when B117 came through uh, Michigan. Some people are surprised why that didn't get bigger. I think the reason it didn't get bigger is because it was so close to this surge and there was some leftover immunity. What seems to happen is that when a variant comes through, people are immune for about six to eight months until the next variant comes through. So I think these two might have been too close. That's my pet theory. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. But I think we're going to be heading up. There's enough space here. I think Delta is going to come rushing through and I think our numbers are heading up this way. Why do I say that? Well, if you look at the United Kingdom, they're coming off of that B117 variant and it's been six to eight months. Delta's coming through. They're already at 52 per 100,000. They're heading on, on to just as bad as the last surge. Uh, United States is not there, but I think you always need to look at United States at the state level to, to say, well, because everything is, it's, we're such a big country, just like this is the rest of these countries are the EU, you need to look at country by country, you need to look at us state by state, and what does that look like? Well, if you look at state by state, you can see, hmm, Arkansas is already at 34 per 100,000. That's a pretty steep curve heading up. Missouri's heading up. Nevada, Louisiana, Utah. It's just a matter of time. And so I think we're going to get another big surge as more and more states. It'll be primarily in the rural areas, unfortunately, because they're the least vaccinated. There are, there are uh, counties in Nebraska where even the elderly are only 20, 30 percent vaccinated. So there's going to be a pretty heavy death toll, unfortunately. So this is what we have to look forward to. And this is why I'm saying I think we're going to be wearing masks in school in August. Uh, last thing, I'll just leave you with booster vaccines. Uh, this is a hot topic, and honestly, nobody knows the answer to this yet. I've heard really good experts saying, go ahead and get the third booster. I've heard a lot saying, no, wait. We don't have enough data yet, and, and it's really not for most people at rush quite yet. I would wait a few weeks, see what comes out. There's, there are a lot of meetings and studies happening right now. I think there's going to be a lot of data coming out soon on this one. And as usual, your local epidemiologist does a great job going through it. So if you really want to know more, read through her po whole post, uh, and basically stay tuned on this one. 
So hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, remember, of course, these are my opinions, not necessarily everybody I'm, I'm working with and for, including Lincoln Public Schools. I'm one of seven school board members, so just because I say something doesn't mean that's what LPS is going to do. Uh, one school board member doesn't have a lot of power. It takes four school board members. So uh, I can't tell for sure what's going to happen, but I think uh, my prediction is we'll be having masks in school in August.